Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good evening from United Arab Emirates. Good afternoon from Europe. And good morning from Canada. My name, Fathiyah al awadi I'm the president of Emirates Diabetes Society. And on behalf of the Emirates Diabetes Society Board, I'm delighted to welcome you all to our first webinar and online uh, educational session, which is the EDS Connect. And today we will be covering the pituitary workshop. And we are uh, grateful that we have a great speaker who are connecting with us all the way from uh, Canada, as well as from United Arab Emirates. And they will be presented shortly by my colleague, Dr. Jum al Kabi, who is the Vice President of the Emirates Diabetes Society, and he's the Dean of the Medical College at UAE University. We all at the EDS, um, uh, you know, delighted to have this uh, you know, uh, first uh, EDS uh, Connect and also those uh, webinars. Uh, and I would like to share with you our, um, you know, next activity that's going to take place, which is the uh, EDS educational activities that we are planning uh, for the coming six months of this year. One of these will be the EDS Connect, just like the one you are attending today. And it will have a focus meeting uh, in the field of diabetes and endocrinology uh, or obesity, and they will be having different flavor. Uh, in the coming you know, six months, we're going to have around five activity that I'm going to share with you the date of those activity. Uh, they will be focusing on hypertension in depth. Uh, we also will be running a young leader forum, as the name is indicate. It will be run by our uh, young endocrinologist, and we're going to have three meetings, which will have case presentation. Uh, it's going to have also uh, um, a journal club, as well as we're going to have also skills enhancement uh, uh, lectures. We're also going to run uh, two of our updated uh, UAE diabetes type 2 guideline. And I'm going just to share with you right now the calendar, so you can take a screenshot of all the plan event for the 2020. Uh, and as you can see, we're going to start on the month of August till the month of December. So we'll keep you all busy. So we'd love that you all, uh, you know, join us on those uh, activity. And, uh, you know, before I just uh, pass the uh, mic to uh, my colleague, uh, I would like, you know, to encourage all of you to visit the EDS uh, Institute on www.emirisdiabetes.com. Uh, Dot org, and uh, you can find all those activities there. Uh, all those webinars will be uh, you're recording them, and they will be uh, on demand uh, on our website. Uh, and uh, I would also encourage you to uh, fill the evaluation form uh, because this will help us to improve our uh, future activities, uh, as well as you know you can also uh, gain your CME uh, hours. And for now, I would, you know, uh, wish you all, uh, uh, you know, a, a full insight and learning out of this EDS Connect. And I'm now, now going to pass the mic to my colleague, Dr. Jum'a uh, al Kabi, uh, who's the Vice President of Emirates Diabetes Society, who's going to uh, moderate the entire session for this uh, evening. Dr. Jum'a al Kabi, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Fathir al Awadi, and good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the first uh, virtual duty workshop organized by the Emirates Diary Society. Over the coming uh, two hours, we're going to cover uh, interesting topics related to the pituitary, and we have with us four prominent uh, speakers. Slide, please. Yeah. We have Dr. Ali uh, Dhamani. Uh, from Tawam Hospital Al Ain and Dr. Ali Amran from Nova Scotia, Canada, and Dr. David Clark from Nova Scotia, Canada as well, and Dr. Ali Din uh, Bashir. Uh, Dr. Ali Din is from Dubai Hospital, uh, UAE. Next slide, please. And our first speaker about the pituitary will be Dr. Ali Dhamani, who is going to cover. Uh, Acromegaly in UAE, which he has published a paper about this topic. He's a consultant endocrinologist at Tawam Hospital Ain, 
and visiting in the colleges at the New Medical Center, NMC, and a general faculty member at the Department of Medicine at UAE University. He has obtained his MBBS uh, from UAE University in 2006 and completed his residency program in internal medicine at the University of British Columbia in Canada in 2006, uh, 2011, followed by a fellowship program at Dalhousie University in Canada in 2013. Uh, his fellowship was focused on pituitary disorder and thyroid cancer from 2013 to 2014 at Dalhousie University. Uh, he is a founding member and a chairman of Al Ain Internal Medicine Research Conference, which have a regular meeting since the year 2015, annual meeting. He is a board member of the Gulf uh, chapter of the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists. Uh, Thank you so much, Dr. Khaled, and please uh, show your slides. Thank you, Dr. Jamha, for the introduction, and thanks, EDS, for the opportunity. I'm just sharing my slides. Give me a few seconds. Sorry, that's the... Okay. I'd like to welcome you all to our pituitary webinar, and I'm going to cover acromegaly in UAE in the next 15 minutes. I have nothing to disclose, and the objectives are to review acromegaly prevalence in UAE. We'll describe the characteristics of the patients in our country, and then we'll discuss some challenges and recommendations to improve acromegaly care in UAE, and these are also useful to apply for the region as well. As you know, acromegaly is a rare disease. It's characterized by increased IGF-1 and growth hormone secretion, mostly because of uh, pituitary adenoma. Extra pituitary causes are extremely rare. Because of the increased IGF-1 growth hormone, patients have multiple manifestations. The somatic features are the most obvious. They have enlarged extremities, they have enlargement of the nose, enlargement of the lips, spaced teeth, but they also, but they also developed uh, metabolic complications like diabetes, hypertension, osteoarthritis, carpal tunnel also common in these individuals. So this is really a systemic disease. Why do we care about acromegaly? It's important because it's associated with increased mortality. Uh, also, it's associated with uh, impaired quality of life. Data suggest uh, that if we control the disease, then we can restore normal life expectancy as shown in the study from New Zealand, but also from other studies. Uh, there are several uh, data or papers about the epidemiology of acromegaly. The annual incidence is anywhere between three to four cases per year. The uh, prevalence is variable. Uh, in Canada, we conducted a similar study with Dr. Imran and Dr. Clark, and the prevalence of acromegaly in uh, the province of uh, Nova Scotia was around 70 cases per million. But you see other reports uh, showing a higher prevalence as high as 137. From this table, you can see that um, these data mostly come from Europe, and we don't have local data. Looking at pituitary research, I found in 2007, colleagues from Oman published a, a paper on pituitary adenoma in a large tertiary care center in Oman. But if you look at the patients with acromegaly, they had only eight cases on that cohort of 150 uh, patients. So most of them, they have macroadenoma. This basically does not tell you about uh, epidemiology and your incidence or prevalence. Uh, therefore, we thought of doing a, a study to assess acromegaly in UAE. And this is a map of UAE. I live in Al Ain, and Al Ain is a defined ge geographic area where we have multiple centers that we can uh, collaborate with. So we decided to do a multi-center study. Three centers included in the study, Tawam Hospital, Al Ain Hospital, New Medical Center. We actually invited five, but two 
were unable to uh, uh, send the data on time. So the study uh, collected patients uh, with diagnosed with uh, cellular masses between 2011 till 2016, and we defined the last day of the year to assess the prevalence. Uh, 197 patients with cellular masses were residing in Al Ain by the end of 2016. They are residing in Al Ain and they are alive, therefore, they were included in the assessment of prevalence. The majority of those patients have pituitary adenomas, and in this, uh, in this presentation, I'll focus about acromegaly. We had 20 cases, which translates to a prevalence of 26 cases per million. Uh, obviously, this number is much lower compared to the reported rates. When we compare our data to other studies published uh, on the same topic, we see uh, decreased prevalence among all pituitary adenomas. If you look at the uh, yellow arrow, that represents the acromegaly in our study. It's lower compared to other study by three to five folds. If you speak about numbers, specific numbers, we observed 20 cases in our population of, 100, of less than 100,000 people, but the expected number of acromegaly cases in Al Ain should be anywhere between 53 to 105. So we are missing about 30 to 70 cases, and this is most likely due to underdiagnosis. So those patients are in the community and we need to find them. We did find some of them. So these are four cases uh, with acromegaly, uh, previously undiagnosed, picked up. Some of them, uh, I found some of them colleagues in Al Ain Hospital, uh, they picked the cases, and I'm sure that you had similar experience as well. So after those four cases, uh, one had microadenoma. This is the second case uh, diagnosed by Dr. Hori from Al Ain Hospital. And uh, two cases had macroadenoma, and one had uh, double, double pituitary adenoma. All of them had surgeries. The third, you see that some of them, they had typical acromegaly features, overt features, and some are mild, like the last one. The third case was picked, uh, picked up in the airport uh, in Saudi Arabia. So we think the underdiagnosis is uh, common in our city, in our country, and also in the neighboring country. Uh, a recent study from uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, published by Dr. Mosal Malki with his team, they looked at uh, acromegaly new AE. Uh, they had 195 cases from nine centers, and uh, they assessed the population, or population of uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia was 33.7 million. This uh, translated to an estimated prevalence of six cases per million. Again, this is way, way low compared to the reported figures. The authors acknowledge that uh, underdiagnosis is the most likely reason for the low prevalence, but in the study also, some patients may have been followed uh, in other centers. So we think that acromegaly is underdiagnosed. That's uh, clear from the data that I showed. Now we wanted to know what are the characteristics of acromegaly in our uh, city. So in our city, we had 20 cases, but we thought this is not enough. We wanted to expand the, uh, the area uh, to look for acromegaly and we did uh, multi-center study this time, including uh, three additional centers. You see two centers from Abu Dhabi, that's Sheikh Khalifa Medical Center and new medical center in Abu Dhabi. And we also included another uh, referral center in Dubai, that's Dubai Hospital. And we looked at demographics, clinical presentation, what are the treatment modalities and disease control. And the next uh, slides will be showing the features of acromegaly specific to this cohort. So we had uh, 75 patients in total. The mean age is 37.2. Uh, 
most of the patients were male and one third uh, were UAE national and the distribution by region as shown, mostly from Abu Dhabi. So the clinical presentation, most of our patients had headache. The somatic features of acromegaly were prominent as well. Diabetes was present in 45% and one third of the patient had hypertension and sweating. When we look at the rate of hypopituitarism, 27% had hypogonadism, 20% had hypothyroidism and adrenal insufficiency as well. And as expected, uh, DI or diabetes insipidus is rare, occurring in around 3% of the patients. When we look at the etiology of acromegaly, the vast majority of patients had pituitary macroadenoma, here in our cohort, 82.2%. Uh, 11 patients had microadenoma, and two patients had cellar, uh, empty cella with no obvious adenoma. Those two cases underwent extensive uh, workup to uh, rule out extra pituitary uh, acromegaly, including growth hormone releasing hormone, abdominal and thoracic CT with no evidence of uh, tumor. Interestingly, endocrinologists suspected the diagnosis or diagnosed patients uh, and the 70% 70, 70 were diagnosed by endocrinologists. The other three subspecialities that contributed to the diagnosis were family physician, internal medicine, and neurology. Uh, the remaining subspecialities contributed less to the recognition of acromegaly. So when we look at treatment modalities, the vast majority of our patients underwent uh, surgery. 50% uh, of our patients were treated with medical therapy, most commonly with octorotide as monotherapy. Uh, pig vestments were used only in four cases. We didn't have patients treated with cabergulin as monotherapy. Similarly, the combination therapy is not that common, and when it occurred, it's mostly octorotide and cabergulin. 50% uh, of the patients were not on medical therapy at their last visit. Uh, radiotherapy was used in one out of five patients. This is an important slide, and here we assess the control rate defined as normal IGF-1 and growth hormone of less than one mic per deciliter. And only 44% of the cohort had controlled acromegaly. The majority had active disease. Then we looked at variables that predicted the control rate. And we found one variable predicting this uh, control, which is uh, probably, I would say, access to medication or free availability of, the, uh, of uh, medication. So high-tier insurance translates to free access to medication or affordability. Uh, uh, if you have free access or you, are, you have uh, full uh, access to medication, so you can afford the treatment, then the control rate goes up to 70%. If you have no uh, affordability, or the insurance rate, uh, tier was low, then those are the people who had poor control. Uh, surprisingly, tumor size was not a predictive factor in our study, but obviously it's were reported in other studies to influence the treatment outcome. Now, the three points that I want to focus here about, uh, particular about our cohort of acromegaly patient is that the majority were diagnosed by endocrinologists. And if you uh, review the AS acromegaly guidelines from 2011, it states that non-endocrinologists suspect the diagnosis of acromegaly in almost half of the patients. So we think here there is a delay in the diagnosis of those patients until they reach to endocrinologists to make the diagnosis. The other point is that uh, the rate of acromegaly is much higher compared to many other uh, studies. It used to be the second uh, highest after New Zealand, but now with the recent publication of the Saudi cohort, we come the, th the third. 
if you look at cohort from Saudi Arabia, this is also interesting. 92% of their patient had uh, macroadenoma. This also speaks to the delay in diagnosis and mostly also under diagnosis. This certainly will impact the control rate and will impact the surgical outcomes as well. Our control rate is 44%, and this is consistent with data from other countries. Uh, it is within the range of 31 to 70 reported in other studies. Uh, however, I, I, I would like to caution you that we used stringent criteria. We said normal IGF-1 and growth hormone less than one microgram per deciliter. But many studies had uh, more relaxed criteria like normal IGF-1 only or growth hormone less than 2.5. You see different criteria has been used. So direct comparison may not be accurate. At least probably we can directly compare to the uh, study from Saudi Arabia, which is around 60% they had control rate. So reasons of uncontrolled or active disease, this paper from the uh, German uh, cohort, and they noted that patient denial, non-compliance, and variable IGF-1 being the most uh, important reason for active disease. Cost was not an issue, but obviously in our region, uh, it is an important factor. So what are some limitations of our study? So it is a retrospective study. Uh, we had a small cohort, but again, this is not a common disease, a rare disease. Uh, so uh, a large number would be obviously uh, encouraging to have, but this is our data. It's limited a little bit. Data from six centers were included. Uh, so general, we cannot generalize to other centers. Maybe they have mild disease or controlled disease after surgery that are not captured or not referred to these referral centers. So how to improve our uh, acromegaly patient, the care of our acromegaly patient. So I suggest that we need to increase awareness of acromegaly among healthcare professionals. So we need to do more of these webinars, conferences, to educate physicians about uh, the importance of recognizing acromegaly, how to recognize it, and how to start the initial steps in the uh, diagnostic evaluation of such patient. Also, we need a UAE acromegaly database with periodic evaluation of the cases, how they present, how they are treated, what there are the outcomes of treatment, and also to assess mortality. Both of these are easily uh, done, uh, I think, under the EDS umbrella, and hopefully uh, plans can be, uh, can be done for, for reducing the undiagnosed cases and improving care for this patient. Also importantly, probably at a national level, we need to uh, state and find specific pituitary centers of excellence where we don't need uh, every hospital to operate on pituitary cases. Probably two or three in the UAE would be enough. Here I'm showing uh, one of the announcements from Tawam Hospital that's long time back, about uh, eight or 10 years ago, uh, announcing a pituitary uh, clinic in the afternoon of Monday. That's uh, initiated by Dr. Ali Elhoni. It's, uh, it's still uh, at work. We do have pituitary clinics. Uh, we do have MDTs, uh, a little bit delayed or interrupted by the COVID, but inshallah will, will be restarted soon. We have uh, the full capacity to act as a pituitary center of excellence. We have uh, dedicated surgeons, uh, radiotherapists, we have endocrinologists, and uh, research is ongoing in, uh, in uh, pituitary as well to support all the components needed for Pituitary Center of Excellence. Now, I want to show, to show a case to highlight the importance of early recognition and treatment of acromegaly. So this is a 38-year-old male with type 2 diabetes for four years, he was treated with metformin, one gram DID, and his A1C was 7.2. The endocrinologist suspected he has uh, diabetes because of his coarse facial features, headache, and increased sweating. 
IG1 was four times upper limit of normal and he had pituitary macroadenoma. He underwent surgery in our hospital and within six months, he was able to stop metformin. His A1C was uh, controlled off medications. Five years after surgery, still his A1C is uh, controlled 6.1. Obviously, he didn't go into remission, but at least off therapy. His IGF-1 normalized within three months. And the thing that made the difference for the patient is the look. He found a significant improvement in the facial features starting within two months after surgery. And his quality of life has significantly improved. So if I want to conclude from the data that I've shown you, think acromegaly in UAE and probably in the region around us is underdiagnosed, not well controlled. There is room for improvement. And the main ways to improve the care of patients with acromegaly would be to educate healthcare providers, uh, establish uh, acromegaly database, national, probably regional as well, and also aim to uh, start pituitary and support pituitary center of excellence. Uh, I would like to thank all of my colleagues, especially those who participated in the studies. I mentioned their names. Uh, I apologize if I dropped some names and I leave you with a picture of uh, College of Medicine and Health Science. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Khaled Dahmani, for interesting talk uh, covering your uh, local study, urgent study, and the review of the literature in the region uh, about acromegaly and pituitary disorders. Very informative. Uh, I'm glad to see that we have over 315 participants joined us in this symposium, and uh, we're receiving uh, some questions. And I would like to uh, um, just uh, let you know that you could uh, write in your questions at Q&A. Um, after the second speaker, we're going to have a short uh, break and we're going to discuss uh, and go over these questions. Our second speaker is one of the prominent figures in pituitary disorders, Dr. and Professor Ali Umran. We're going to cover uh, update medical management of academically. Uh, he is the head of division of the college, the college at Dalhousie University, Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. So Amran is a professor of medicine and cross appointed to the Dalhousie Department of Obstetric and Gynecology and the Division of Neurosurgeries and Department of Surgery. He is also director of thyroid oncology and neurobutary clinics at Queen Elizabeth II's Health Sciences Center. Dr. Imran's research interests include engaged in both clinical and lab neuropituitary disorders, central uh, adiponectin signal, signaling, and uh, actively involved laboratory research. And he has over 115 publications to his credit. And Dr. Imran is also a recipient of several peer reviewed grants and is a reviewer of various scientific. It's our pleasure to have him with us in this symposium. And if you go to the Canadian guidelines in pituitary disorders, uh, Dr. Amran is one of the authors uh, of these uh, guidelines. Welcome, uh, Dr. Amran. Please show your slides. Very good. Thank you. So, once again, thank you so much uh, for inviting me. It's a great honor. It's absolutely wonderful to see uh, our colleague Khalid. And certainly, it's a, it's a great moment of pride for both Dr. Clark and myself to see Khalid uh, doing wonderfully well. So I, like Khalid, have no disclosures. I'm going to talk quickly about a few things. So I'm going to discuss uh, as a case-based approach, I'm going to talk about um, a case of acromegaly and highlight some of the common diagnostic and therapeutic pitfalls. The reason it is important is because uh, uh, 
some of you here have a lot of experience in uh, pituitary disorders. Others uh, may not have seen as many uh, cases. I'm going to talk about a little bit more about the inordinate delay in diagnosing acromegaly, which uh, uh, Dr. Khalid uh, actually alluded to, and then the emerging concepts of, um, of uh, what we call as personalized medicine in acromegaly. If you're interested in some of the source documents, uh, this is, uh, if you go to uh, register with MD briefcase, Dr. Clark and I um, wrote uh, some guidelines there. Uh, I was involved in the Canadian guidelines and uh, some of the pathophysiological uh, aspects of acromagaly I've taken from this uh, book that I had the pleasure of uh, authoring with my colleague, uh, Professor Wilkinson. So I want to start with a case here. This is a case, uh, uh, probably familiar to Khalid as well. A 53-year-old male was referred to a cardiology in 2017. And this was for arrhythmias. And um, uh, it was the cardiologist who noticed marked facial features of acromegaly. And uh, as usual, uh, symptoms when we asked the question began many years ago, the change in the ring size. And he had bought larger size shoes back in 92. He started feature, having features of sleep apnea about 12 or 15 years ago, fatigue, weakness, uh, uh, sorry, fatigue, and excessive sweating, joint aches and pains, and low mood about a, a decade ago. So this is a very classical presentation and sadly continues to remain like that, even though uh, things have changed quite dramatically. I'm just, just going to show you the progression of features. These are his passport photographs, and I took his permission to share these uh, images with you. Back in 1988, you can see this uh, slow progression of, uh, of facial features, uh, which is uh, becoming more and more pronounced. And this was around, this was uh, how he looked uh, in 2012. And obviously, uh, as I said, he was then, uh, he came to hospital uh, and was, uh, was diagnosed here. When we looked at his initial data, uh, his, uh, uh, his, pituitary hormonal profile was essentially unremarkable apart from mildly elevated prolactin. These are our uh, reference ranges. So uh, prolactin was uh, elevated, IGF-1 was elevated, and testosterone level was at the lower end of the normal range. Uh, we did an oral glucose tolerance test on him, uh, and these are the numbers, and uh, obviously he failed to suppress uh, to the required number, and I'll come to that in a minute, but this was the result of the oral glucose tolerance test. If you look at the MRI, this was his MRI, uh, and the, these are um, the coronal sections, uh, and you can obviously see uh, an abnormality here, another abnormality, the same abnormality obviously in the sagittal section and the T2-weighted MRI, so you can obviously see how uh, this patient had a macroadenoma, and uh, in many cases, pituitary tumors that uh, produce uh, prolactin or some of the growth hormone and prolactin producing tumors, they tend to have a very specific growth pattern. They tend to grow uh, downwards. So what are the issues here? Well, uh, are there any diagnostic pitfalls and can we avoid them? So in this case, this was a very classical presentation, classical features, high IGF-1, so, you know, uh, there, there shouldn't be any diagnostic pitfalls, but in many cases, there are. So I'm not going to spend too much time. I, I don't have, I only have 30 minutes, but, uh, but uh, this is the classic view of how growth hormone is, is controlled. So growth hormone is produced by the pituitary under the stimulatory effect of growth hormone, releasing hormone, and the inhibitory effect of somatostatin and the growth hormone acts on your liver to produce IGF-1, which then feeds back into the hypothalamus and pituitary and sort of regulates the production of growth hormone. But one thing that we actually have discussed in our book is, is missing from all this classical view is the role of ghrelin. So ghrelin actually, which is a hormone produced by the gut uh, and that's in response to food, is the most uh, potent stimulator of growth hormone. And as a matter of fact, we now know that there is a central control mechanism, which is what I've shown here. And then there's a peripheral control mechanism, which is uh, what 
uh, is now emerging. And that, and, and depending upon different species, uh, these two mechanisms uh, take precedence over one or other. Now, growth hormone is produced in a pulsatile fashion. We all know that. So when you are interpreting growth hormone levels, you have to be very careful because growth hormone levels released during, uh, are, uh, during your sleep. So people who have abnormal sleep, for instance, people who are sleep deprived are those who have a daytime sleepiness uh, as opposed to, you know, the, like the shift workers, for instance, you will find that their growth hormone patterns will change. So if you in your center tend to measure your growth hormone as a fasting growth hormone, morning growth hormone level, you have to be very careful uh, 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 before you measure it and know what your patient's uh, sleep patterns are. The other important aspect, as I was mentioning, is ghrelin. And ghrelin is a protein which is produced by the gut. And your food intake has a very profound effect on your growth hormone. For instance, in this particular uh, slide, which I took from our book, essentially show that when you have your breakfast, lunch, and dinner, your meals, you have a spike in growth hormone production. And of course, during your sleep as well. So as a result, if you want to um, check the nadir or baseline growth hormone level, you must do it in a, a, in a fasting state. So what is the clinical relevance? So in order for you to, and this is a very common diagnostic pitfall, you must check your growth hormone in a fasting state and you must uh, check it first thing in the morning on waking up uh, rather than having a random growth hormone. And if your patient is a shift worker, then you have to be very careful in interpreting growth hormone. The other common problem that uh, I see, and I don't know if that's, uh, or, uh, this is where you see discordant results in the effect of estrogens. Estrogens actually suppress hepatic production of IGF-1. And as a result, uh, what it does is that it then stimulates the production of growth hormone. So you get uh, a low IGF-1, which in borderline acromegaly patients can actually become completely normal even though they have borderline acromegaly, growth hormone level will be elevated. So therefore in people, in women who are on estrogen therapy, if you want to measure their true underlying growth hormone level, it is ideal for asking them to stop their estrogen for six to eight weeks so that you can remove the effect of uh, this particular uh, hormone. Similarly, the effect of testosterone, um, we all know that IGF-1 level, which is a measure of your growth hormone activity, these levels tend to be very high in adolescent and teenagers. And as we get older, IGF-1 levels tend to pitter out. And um, IGF-1 levels are not truly dependent alone on your chronological age, which is the age in years, but it is very much dependent upon your maturity stage. So for instance, in young individuals, who have hypogonadism, which means that they have a low testosterone, they don't quite reach the age of maturity. And even though they are in their you know, 20s or uh, early 20s, their bone age actually may be that of a teenager. And when you look at their IGF-1 level, you, uh, I mean, and if you look at the age-based reference range, you will be misinterpreting them. So in that case, you actually need to look at their age, their, their bone age based range, which it generally tends to be higher. And, uh, and therefore, uh, the other option is to give them testosterone, make sure that they reach their normal uh, bone age. And that's when you can start using these adult reference ranges. So this is another problem that uh, uh, we, have, we have actually published uh, a paper in this uh, area. So in terms of diagnosing acromegaly, I mean, you're looking at clinical features. Sadly, in most cases, they are very advanced. Uh, you look at uh, a fasting growth hormone, which uh, generally is over two. This, if, if you look at fasting, and I've got a relatively unhappy face here, means that it's not a very good test. Um, the ideal test is failure of growth hormone to suppress to less than one. Uh, and I put in brackets less than 0.4. And this is because, again, this is a very common problem. Uh, the endocrine society has uh, mandated uh, a suppression to less than one, but this is using an insensitive growth hormone assay. If your center, like our center, uses a sensitive or ultra-sensitive growth hormone assay, 
growth hormone actually should suppress to less than 0.4. And I know Dr. Uh, Aldamani alluded to that. So a lot of people, when you're using a suppression of less than one, uh, and you find the IGF-1 is elevated because uh, those, these people actually may have acromegaly because you're not using the appropriate cutoff range. So ask your lab uh, what test, uh, what growth hormone test they're using, and then use the appropriate cutoff. Serum IGF-1 must be elevated unless your patient has liver disease, they have malnutrition, or they're on estrogen therapy, as I pointed out, and the MRI of this cell uh, typically would show uh, an abnormality, where in rare cases you may not find it uh, because it's hidden somewhere in the cavernous area. And in some cases, of course, you may have aberrant um, sort of um, ectopic production, but that's very, very rare. Why is there such a delay in diagnosis and can we do something about it? Uh, this is a very important point, and I think uh, Carl alluded to it. Uh, this is called his paper uh, when we looked at uh, acromegaly, and it's the second calmness functioning pituitary tumor. Uh, so, so it, yes, it is, it is relatively common. And uh, in Nova Scotia, it would still mean five to six new cases per year. But the question is, is that really the case? And Khalid was quite right in saying that we are underdiagnosing it. In fact, we published this particular paper looking at the incidental pituitary tumor. These are the tumors that do not present with any classical clinical features. And even in this case, up to 5% of incidental pituitary tumors were, uh, were in fact uh, growth hormone producing adenomas. And many of them had uh, you know, uh, subclinical symptoms. Um, now, the trouble is that we are actually doing a pretty bad job of diagnosing these people. This is a paper that we published uh, now seven years ago. We looked at two cohorts uh, of, uh, and this was a, a multicenter Canadian study. We looked at two cohorts from 1980 to 94 and 95 to 2010. And look at the mean age of diagnosis. So in fact, the mean age of diagnosis in the more recent cohort is actually five years high older. So the, we are actually doing a worse job, if you like, and, and these people are diagnosing much late, being diagnosed much later in life. So this is a major problem. As Colin alluded to this fact, an untreated acromegaly causes early death. So if you treat them, these people, and there are a number of studies, this meta-analysis shows that if you diagnose them early, you improve their outcome uh, by controlling their IGF-1 better. But what are the problems? Well, the problem really is that if you look at and, uh, acromegaly, acromegaly essentially is not a uniform disease. It doesn't present with one type of symptom. You can have a, a, a plethora of symptoms and they might present to rheumatologists with arthropathy, with res respirology, with sleep apnea, Endocrinologists sometimes see them for diabetes and menstrual dysfunction without even recognizing that these patients have um, acromegaly. Then they may present to dentists, uh, they may present to cardiologists as our patient did, or gastroenterologists for clonic cancer or clonic polyps. So, so the trouble is that they don't present in a, in a single fashion. Uh, so um, how can we do something about it? So Dr. Clark, myself, and uh, one of our computer uh, science colleagues, we just actually uh, uh, are starting a study. We are developing an artificial intelligence-based app, uh, which will be working through a mobile phone camera system. We are trying, uh, which will look at the facial vectors of the photographs of the patients, and, we are, and that will identify some of the classic features of acromegaly. We are using our Halifax uh, uh, our, our, um, th This is uh, uh, our morphometric scale, which we developed here in Halifax that has now been published and validated. So we are basically going to start looking at these patients. And if this works, then we are actually going to start the screening program using this uh, mobile phone-based app uh, in Nova Scotia. And hopefully in the next few years, we'll have some answer for you. How do we define remission and uh, are the current criteria of remission reasonable? What about other comorbidities? I think that's a very important aspect and Khalid again alluded to this. 
Normalization of IGF-1 is your first goal of treatment. Uh, it's a key therapeutic goal. Uh, the second therapeutic goal is random growth hormone of less than one. Again, this is a relatively uh, less stringent goal because this is again based off on uh, some of the older insensitive assay. Ideally, if, if the patient is on medical therapy, particularly somatostatin analog therapy, you cannot do an oral glucose tolerance test because of somatostatin analogs will interfere with that. So you use this particular criteria in people who are on medical therapy. But they, if, do, if they do not have medical therapy, then the best thing is to use a 75 gram OGTT and use a cutoff of less than 0 0.4, which will give you the most accurate depiction of whether the uh, patient has normalized or not. Removal of the tumor and symptom control. But here is the key element. These people continue to have problems. So normalizing their IGF-1 or removing the tumor does, in some cases, if you catch them early, as Khalid showed that in his slide, that's wonderful, but most people do not feel better. Now, why do we have to normalize both growth hormone and IGF-1? And that's an important aspect because you can have this discordance. We know that most of the acromegaly features are driven by growth hormone but, uh, sorry, by IGF-1, but uh, uh, the social behavior, heart and muscle function, uh, adiposity and lipid pathways, all of these are directly affected by growth hormone without, uh, without IGF-1. So you really need to ensure as much as you possibly can to normalize your growth hormone and IGF-1 both. The trouble is that biochemical remission, whether you achieve it through growth hormone, IGF-1, both, whatever, does not mean that the patient feels back to normal. In many cases, they continue to have hypertension, dysglycemia, arthritis, which is actually the most uh, uh, chronic and, uh, and, and uh, hard disease to control. Obstructive sleep apnea gets better. They continue to have lingering psychiatric problems. And sometimes they need corrective surgeries for teeth and jaw, but it is, arth it is the arthritis um, which basically causes this most uh, difficult uh, course in these patients afterwards. And that is something we need to work on. Now in our center, we take a much more comprehensive view and regard acromegaly more as a chronic disease rather than saying, you know, yeah, IGF-1 is normal, so your biochemical control and thank you very much, you've done a good good job. We continue to follow them. And as a matter of fact, uh, our uh, new research fellow, uh, uh, Kevin Chen and Dr. Clark and myself, we are currently uh, starting a study. We just received a funding for that uh, to look at the impact of uh, acromegaly on your joints. Particularly, um, we are looking at, the, uh, at these patients uh, looking at the joint laxity, walking patterns, weight distribution, changes in acromegaly joint alignment, because that's what causes a, an ongoing um, a difficult, uh, difficulty and pain. And we are going to start uh, developing interventions to see if we can improve their, uh, their uh, joint disease and hopefully make them feel better once their growth hormone IGF-1 has normalized. Now, I think this is um, going to come to the, the most important aspect of treatment because as Khalid mentioned, treatment is expensive. Uh, not many people have insurance coverage and the cost of treatment can vary from $80 in our Canadian dollars from when it comes to dopamine agonist to $5,000 a month when it comes to pegvisomate. So can we do better? Uh, and I'll show you, this is the, this is the endocrine society treatment um, flow chart and basically if you look at it and we focus in this area so this patients either had surgery and did not uh, normalize or surgery could not be done in this particular group you have three options you have somatostatin analogs you have dopamine agonists and your pegismin and mostly what do what people do is they can they sort of pick the cheapest option then they go to the more expensive and then the more expensive or they try one and then go for the other and then go for the third one. This whole process can sometimes take months or years and the patients may remain uncontrolled 
and sometimes these drugs uh, are, are not effective. So it takes you months, sometimes years to find out. These are the agents. So you can either use somatostatin, you can use dopamine agonists, or you can use growth hormone receptor antagonists like pegvisomant. So the question really is, and, and sorry, and these are the costs, uh, which as I mentioned, this can be quite different. So can we do better than that? So let's go through this particular scenario because I think this is where our guidelines are very helpful. With response to, with regards to the cabergoline um, as a treatment, uh, the data suggests that 30%, 34% of patients achieve a growth hormone of less than 2.5 but that does not mean they achieve normal IGF-1 as well. You need a very large dose. And in our experience, less than 5% of people will achieve uh, a good control uh, with cabergoline alone. So it's not a very effective drug. It's more effective in tumors where you have a combination of growth hormone and prolactin. And it's effective if you have a very mildly elevated IGF-1, about one and a half times the upper limit of normal. If you have a significantly elevated IGF-1, uh, it is, it's not going to work on its own as an adjunct maybe, but not on its own. Somatostatin analog therapy, uh, in this case, lenreotide, if you look at the data, if you look at the normalization of IGF-1, it occurs in almost 50% of the patients. Look at the growth hormone of less than 2.5, again, are not a very good criteria, but even that about 50%, and if you look at the proper control, which is both, that's actually around 40%, 44%, which means that roughly around 60% of your patients are not going to be controlled on somatostatin analog therapy. And the same data, uh, you know, ditto is for octreotide. Now we can do better than that. And I think this is important because if we look at our patients who respond, the question is who are those 44% who would respond to somatostatin analog therapy. If you look at their pathological characteristics, you will find that those patients who have a densely granulated pituitary tumor, uh, if in your pathology, they are the ones who, would, who are better responders because in 75% of those patients will respond. Whereas if you have a sparsely granulated tumor, you're more likely to be a non-responder. So there and then you can look at the tumor pathology and you can determine these are the patients who are not going to respond. Now, in some cases, if your pathologist does not report the granulation pattern, you can actually look at the MRI, the T2-weighted MRI to be more specific. And there is a nice correlation or somewhat of a correlation between the granulation pattern and the intensity of the MRI. So if you look at the T2-weighted MRI, uh, you will find that densely granulated tumor, which will respond, are more likely to be hypo-intense or iso-intense compared to the surrounding brain structure, whereas the sparsely granulated tumor tend to be hyper-intense compared to the surrounding uh, brain structure. So this would allow you to even uh, to look at the MRI even before uh, your patient undergoes surgery and you can determine which particular drug would be useful. If you look at the, as I was saying, a sparsely granulated tumor, they are, they are unlikely to respond to a somatostatin analog therapy, whereas densely granulated do. But if you look at the sparsely granulated tumor, they very easily respond to pegvisomant therapy. So you can identify beforehand and rather than you know, going through expensive treatment and trying one treatment versus other, you know exactly which treatment would be ideal for these patients. Uh, what about the new uh, somatostatin analog therapy called Pasiriotide? Pasiriotide has a much broader somatostatin activity, uh, somatostatin receptor activity. And in this particular study, uh, where they uh, uh, took people who were not pro uh, responding to octreotide alone. They changed them to pasiriotide, which is a second generation somatostatin analog with a broader somatostatin receptor activity. And they said that roughly about uh, 23 to 24%, 25% of the patients 
would respond by normalizing their IGF-1. I have used this drug, but the problem is that uh, almost 30 to 40 percent of the patient, they will go on to develop, uh, unfortunately, hyperglycemia and diabetes. So, so you have to be very careful if you're using, particularly in diabetes patients, this is quite a common problem. I'll quickly take you through the data on peglisomine therapy. This is the early paper by Peter Trainer, uh, who basically showed that almost 95% of the patients in their first study showed uh, normalization of IGF-1. But in the real world study, which is the ACRO study, and I was involved in this particular study, only about 60% of the patients actually had normalization of IGF-1. And that means that 40% of the patients who go on pegvisomine therapy as a first-line treatment will not normalize their IGF-1. So 60% in somatostatin analogs, 40% uh, of the patient will not respond to pegvisomant. So this is just a quick slide to show you uh, the pituitary tumor. So this is a slide from our paper. This is the granulation pattern. You can ask your pathologist to look at this, and these are granules. Uh, this is densely granulated, and this is a sparsely granulated, and you can see it in cytokeratin stain as well. Your pathologist should be able to uh, essentially uh, uh, look at this, these features and, and mention it to you. And this is, again, a slide from our paper. So essentially, if you have a densely granulated tumor, and if you're doing somatostatin receptor, um, uh, you test for them in, uh, we don't do it routinely in our center, but some centers do, uh, or you have a hypo-intense T2-weighted MRI, then you should go straight for somatostatin analog therapy. That would be, that would work in vast majority of these cases. On the other hand, if you have a sparsely granulated tumor with a low expression of somatostatin receptor, you have a hyperintensity to weighted MRI. And if IGF-1 is one and a half times the upper limit of normal or less, you can start with dopamine agonists. But if it is more, then there's no time, point in wasting time in somatostatin analogs. Go straight for pegvisomant. <clears throat> that would be your best uh, uh, way forward. Uh, and that will save your patient a lot of time. So back to the case. Um, uh, in this particular situation, this patient had surgery. Dr. Clark uh, did the operation in May 2018. Pathology was diffuse uh, growth hormone and patchy prolactin, so it did mixed somatoelectrotrophic tumor. It was in between densely and sparsely granulated. Um, so in his case, he probably would have needed um, either one or, or, or other, but depending upon whichever was predominant, I would have treated him accordingly. But fortunately, his IGF-1 level completely normalized after surgery. We did an oral glucose tolerance test. He didn't quite reach at uh, the uh, 0.4 cutoff. It was 0.87, but I've been watching him. So he probably still has a very, very low level of, uh, act, uh, of active disease, but certainly nothing uh, uh, that I would treat him with. Uh, he had sleep studies. He had echo. He had my, 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 mitral regurgitation. We always do thyroid ultrasound scans because acromegaly people have a higher risk of thyroid cancer, and we are now doing some other studies. So uh, that's kind of the quick uh, uh, update on um, acromegaly. These are some pictures. This is uh, Carla with me. We were presenting uh, a, a study at the Endocrine Society meeting. This is when I came to see Carla and took me to Tim Horton on a very hot Dubai day. <laughs> This is my wife and I, we went to see Khalid. I think Khalid, this is your hospital. And once again, I would like to thank all the colleagues for uh, having me around. And I'm going to probably ask Dr. Clark, uh, there's a, I think a short brief interval now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ali Amran for clear uh, presentation. Um, oh. Some of the participants, they comment that there was some interruption in the slideshow, but for me, the slideshow was flowing nicely without any interruption. Uh, we'll spend five minutes uh, to ask, uh, we just respond to the question by the audience. We received a number of questions, and I would like the, to ask to the panelists, the panelists to uh, respond to the question, please. Do, do, are you ready for the questions? 
Um, you're asking me, um, Dr. Juma? Yeah. Uh, either you or Dr. Khaled or Dr. Uh, Clark or Dr. Aladdin. Um, we received a number of questions. I'm go are we going to spend like five minutes over them. Sure. First, um, the first question, does acromegaly run in families? Yes, acromegaly does run in families. So there are uh, a number of conditions. Uh, particularly, we know that there are conditions like multiple endocrineoplasias. We know neurofibromatosis. Uh, and so, you know, so these are some of the conditions where uh, people have a familial acromegaly uh, and, uh, and also there is a, a condition called, uh, you know, uh, with AIP mutation FIPA, uh, in which case, uh, and we have a case actually, Khalid knows about the case, so this can run in, in family. So if you have someone in the family with acromegaly, yes, you have to test for all these genetic mutations. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. And the second question is uh, for Dr. Khaled. Um, regarding your uncontrolled patients, whether they are on 20 milligram or higher doses of octreotide? So most of our patients with octreotide, the non-UE patients, they get it through Musanada and Musanada which is a third uh, party uh, provider of uh, octreotide, they start with 30 milligrams. So among those who are uncontrolled, they are on the 30 milligram octreotide LAR. Even some of them, they tried uh, higher doses, uh, some with benefit and majority in our experience did not, exp uh, did not have a, a significant improvement in IG phonograph alone. So I would say just uh, in short, most of them, they are on the 30 milligram octreotide dose. Okay, right. And the third question regarding, it's been partially answered, it's regarding optimized diagnosis and screening and finding of acromegalic subjects, uh, how to optimize the diagnosis in terms of population capturing of the cases. Uh, already that's being covered. I think that was covered probably yeah. in the slides. Yeah. Yeah. Right. What about pediatric acromegaly? How to diagnose and what are the symptoms? That's a very good question. Um, so pediatric acromegaly, first of all, IGF-1 is a problematic test because you have such a wide range of IGF-1. Uh, but typically these people will have a higher uh, IGF-1 um, but in these people, you still, you should do the glucose tolerance test uh, because that is, that's a much better test. For, but if you want to use the surrogate marker, then IGF binding protein three is a much better marker because it has a narrow uh, range as opposed to IGF one. So, I mean, that's, that's what I would typically recommend in, uh, in pediatric cases. If we have a clear cut case of, of with no doubts, clinically very high IGF-1 and the MRI pituitary showing macroadenoma, then is there any reason to do glucose growth hormone test uh, at time of diagnosis? I mean, I meant OGCT. Yeah, I know we get this question uh, not infrequently. The answer is absolutely because IGF-1 um, you know, yes, you are going to gain very little by doing a, for, uh, an oral glucose tolerance test, but that is the gold standard test. You have to do that. And secondly, you will have something to compare it against or down the road when you want to look at the response because IGF-1, what if IGF-1 is a little bit, because it's 15 to 20% variability in IGF-1 values. So that is the major problem with IGF-1. And so if you, if you want to use one test before and after, the best test is your oral glucose tolerance test. IGF-1 does not have that level of uh, sensitivity, specificity to give you such a nice reading. The other problem I also want to point out, IGF-1, after the removal of the tumor, may take six to nine months, sometime a year before it normalizes. So you will have really no way of knowing if your patient is controlled or not controlled after surgery. So if you've done an oral glucose tolerance test before, and then you do one after, you will see a very clear pattern. So I always do uh, OGTT. 
I may have a different opinion on this, Dr. Amran. It's, uh, it's our approach. If a patient has established uh, features of acromegaly and you have evidence of biochemical disease as well as obvious adenoma, we sometimes bypass the OGTT in such cases. And we, we, we think that OGTT, when, it's too, when the growth hormone is too high or the growth hormone is uh, mildly, uh, mildly in, the, in the lower range of normal, there is little benefit or utility of OGTT. But we do skip uh, the clear cut cases, at least at diagnosis. Maybe you need them for a follow up, but for diagnosis, we do uh, skip uh, those clear cut cases. Yeah, the um, second question follows here is the utilization of the uh, OGT testing in diabetic patients to diagnose or follow up patient, patient with acromegaly, <clears throat> especially uncontrolled. Diabetes. Yeah, so that's a very good question as well. I just want to point out it is not your absolute glucose level because 25% of your acromegaly people will have diabetes. It's not your absolute glucose level which leads to suppression of. Uh, uh, growth hormone is a rate of rise of glucose, which actually is important. And that rate of rise is very similar in diabetic patients as well. Yes, I mean, the, 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 the level is high uh, uh, as opposed to the non-diabetes patients, but uh, OGTT with growth hormone measurement is equally good in, in diabetes patients. Even with uncontrolled diabetes? Yeah, because you're giving them glucose and the glu it's the rate of rise of glucose that actually is associated with growth hormone. It is not the absolute glucose. So somebody is running around with a glucose of, let's say, 20 millimole per liter or 8, 15 millimole per liter for argument's sake. If you gave them glucose, you will obviously, that their glucose will go from 15 to 25. It's that change in glucose from the baseline value to the post-75 uh, OGTT, which leads to the uh, reduction in growth hormone or suppression of growth hormone, not the absolute glucose value. Yeah. There is a question about growth hormone and cirrhosis the liver. Um, I'm sorry? A and cirrhosis. Oh, cirrhosis, yeah. yeah. If a patient develops growth uh, hormone secreting adenoma while he has hepatic problem with low IGF-1 production, what is your goal on treatment? Especially most of the actions of growth hormone are mediated through IGF-1. Yeah, so IGF-1 is a marker for chronic liver disease. And that's a good question. So, so you have to keep it. This is why I, want, I answered that question partially in my slide. Why to normalize growth hormone and IGF-1 both? Because you need to normalize both of them ideally because growth hormone does have direct effects independent of IGF-1 as well. So even if your IGF-1 levels are low in cirrhotic patients or chronic liver disease patients, you got to keep in mind that you still need to uh, lower their, uh, their growth hormone uh, levels to, to achieve, achieve that, um, that type of status. But if that's bad, if they're really, you know, end stage uh, liver disease, then, you know, Problem. Acromegaly is least of their problem at that point. Uh, we have lots of questions here, but probably we're coming to the end because of the limitation and time. Uh, well, the last question is, um, is there any way to define receptor type of the adenoma rather than the biopsy? I mean, is there any lab test we could do to find the type of the um, receptor changes? Did you mean receptor changes? I, I'm sorry, I, I think there was some interruption. The question was not clear. He's speaking about a receptor type of the adenoma. Which particular receptor are they looking at? I'm not quite clear. And uh, uh, biopsy. I don't, we, we tend to depend on the trans, uh, transphenodal biopsy of the pituitary to tell about the receptor. But from blood oh, tests, you so, can't do it. No, if, if, no. So, 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 so what they're saying is, so. By and large, as I was saying, if you want to look at any receptor, there are the receptor you want to look at is somatostatin receptor. If it is expressed, uh, type two and type five receptors are expressed in there, 
then you know that this patient is going to respond to somatostatin analog therapy. Other than that, there are a bunch of receptors uh, which you can look at, uh, this matrix metalloproteins and all the others. I don't think that uh, an average clinician really needs to do that and doesn't have any bearing. It can tell you if the tumor is um, aggressive or not, but it's not going to uh, do anything in terms of your clinical management. But you can bypass all that by simply looking at the MRI and granulation pattern. Thank you. Thanks, Riley. I will move on to the third speaker. There are more than 30 questions pending here on the list, but I'm afraid we can't go through all the questions. Our third speaker is uh, Professor David Clark, and he's going to speak about outcome of surgery patient with acromegaly. Uh, Dr. David Clark is a professor within the Department of Surgery, Neurosurgery, and e Medical Neurosciences, uh, Endocrinology, Ophthalmology, and Visual Sciences. He's the head of the Division of Neurosurgery at Dalhousie University and Nova Scotia, Authority, Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. His clinical interests are predominantly in the areas of management of pituitary and brain tumors, surgical treatment of epilepsy, traumatic brain injury, he has special interest in the application of simulation techniques in the neurosurgical education. Uh, he performed the world's first open brain surgery in a virtual reality environment, for which he wa has been awarded the National Research Council Outstanding Achievements Award for Canada. Clark is the founder and the past director of Canada's first national Probably um, for neuro for new neurosurgical trainees. Dr. Clark is the co-chair of the Halifax Neuropituitary Program. He has published over 70 peer-reviewed articles. Welcome, uh, Dr. David, and we're looking forward for your talk. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Juma. Uh, you want to say I will this? just. I will just get my slides up here. This one, is, uh, no, this is uh, this one. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, can you hear me and see my slide? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, to uh, uh, Dr. Khalid and uh, the rest of the uh, symposium team for uh, inviting me to participate. Uh, it is indeed uh, an honor to, uh, to be here. In my talk on the surgical treatment of uh, acromegaly, there are uh, no disclosures that I have to make re related to this talk. And these are the objectives that I hope to achieve in this uh, short time. Uh, as a surgeon, I always like the, uh, to take a, a short opportunity to review a little bit of anatomy and, uh, and we'll look at that in relation to some imaging as well. Um, and then uh, specifically to the task at hand, uh, examine what is the role of surgery in the treatment of acromegaly, look at remission rates after surgery, uh, try to address the question of is there a role for surgery in unresectable tumors and uh, to finish on uh, a little bit of uh, uh, sharing of, uh, of what we do uh, if with our uh, patients uh, after transgenital surgery. So uh, let's uh, look at a little bit uh, of anatomy. And of course, we start with the cella tersica or the uh, Turkish saddle. And my understanding is that you can see my uh, arrow. So uh, this. Uh, a uh, sagittal view uh, shows the uh, cella ter tersica, uh, which uh, holds uh, the uh, pituitary gland. And uh, our standard approach uh, these days is through uh, the uh, sphenoid sinus, which is uh, here, and hence the term transgenoidal uh, surgery. Now, if we were to uh, peer into the sphenoid sinus, uh, as if you're looking through the nose and then look at the back part of the sphenoid sinus. Uh, this, is, uh, this is what you would, uh, you would see. 
uh, and here the uh, mucosa has been uh, stripped off and you see that there are uh, several uh, septations of bone in the, in the sphenoid sinus and this is variable from one uh, person to another. Uh, the roof of the sphenoid sinus is the flat uh, part of the cranial base in the anterior cranial fossa or the planum sphenoid alley. And from a surgical point of view, an important aspect to uh, keep in mind is that we see the uh, optic nerves here on, the, uh, uh, on both sides and that these optic nerves, uh, this uh, here uh, is in the apex of the orbit, but as they, as they go and travel intracranially towards the optic chiasm, that they do so uh, in a uh, anterior posterior direction and traveling from lateral to medial. Now, if we take off the uh, bone overlying uh, the back part of the uh, cella, then we see uh, the uh, pituitary gland. And so the dura, the bone has been removed and the dura has been removed. The pituitary gland is uh, surrounded by a, a venous uh, a plexus. And uh, we also see in the lateral part of the uh, cella and the cavernous sinus, the internal carotid arteries here on the uh, right and here on the, on the left. And uh, the relationship between the uh, pituitary gland and pituitary tumor and the internal carotid artery is obviously an important one uh, from a surgical point of view. Um, and again, uh, notice that the optic nerve travels over the top of the internal carotid as it travels uh, lateral to medial towards the cavernous sinus. And in the top part of the picture here, we see the hypothalamic pituitary stalk, which travels uh, superiorly uh, into the uh, hypothalamus just posterior to the uh, optic uh, chiasm. Now, uh, as this uh, diagram shows, in the wall of the cavernous sinus uh, on either side of the cella, so here is the pituitary uh, gland within the cella and then the cavernous sinus on either side, there's not only the internal carotid artery but also uh, several cranial nerves. Uh, in particular, uh, cranial nerves three, four, five, one, two, and six. And the nerves most vulnerable to um, a direct compression of an expanding mass laterally into the cavernous sinus are the uh, third nerve and uh, the sixth nerve. I show this uh, a view of the internal carotid artery just uh, again to um, stress the importance of understanding the, uh, the anatomy of the internal carotid artery for the particular patient that you're operating on. And there is, uh, as you might uh, anticipate, uh, considerable variation from one uh, patient to another. Uh, but in general, the internal carotid artery, as it ascends in the neck and the cranial base, in general travels uh, from posteriorly to anteriorly, and also travels from laterally to medially. And this is important because the surgery is typically done uh, uh, on a, a two-dimensional screen. And so appreciating that three-dimensional relationship uh, is very important. So this would be a standard kind of uh, uh, MR that, uh, that many of us have uh, seen. And uh, this would be a T1 uh, MRI, T1 because the CSF is black and it's after gadolinium enhancement. If you can see the stalk deviated to the right and the normal pituitary gland squished uh, towards the uh, cavernous sinus on the right, the internal carotid artery here, uh, internal carotid artery on the other side, and then we see the tumor uh, here. Now, as you can appreciate, the tumor is uh, relatively iso-intense to the overlying optic chiasm and with larger tumors uh, it can be difficult to differentiate the uh, location of the uh, optic nerves and chiasm. And so one of the reasons that we also in have included for many years a, a coronal T2 uh, is to appreciate the, uh, the anatomy of the optic nerves and chiasm. And of course now as Dr. Imran said, uh, we also use the T2 uh, in patients with acromegaly uh, to look at its, uh, at its uh, intensity on MR 
uh, as a predictor to uh, medical response. So in this, uh, in this coronal section, so this is looking straight on, just behind the uh, orbits, we can see the optic nerve on the left and on the right in the, op in the bony uh, canal on its way intracranially. And here we can see the signal voids of the internal carotid artery on the right and on the left. And just above, you see very clearly the optic nerves uh, on the left and on the right as they start to travel immediately uh, here uh, towards the uh, optic chiasm. The uh, tumor here is, uh, is below. And then here we, uh, we see this uh, uh, at the level of the optic chiasm. And so the uh, coronal T2 uh, we find very uh, useful uh, in anticipating the uh, location of the optic nerves and chiasm. Now, given the review of that, uh, of that anatomy, uh, you would uh, be able to anticipate some of the issues that we have to think about uh, in terms of uh, potential complications of surgery. And we can do this by uh, examining what structures are around the tumor that we're going to remove. And so uh, the pituitary gland is, uh, is one part uh, of the uh, overall uh, anatomy that we want to preserve. In this case, the pituitary gland is extremely thin, just over the, over the top of this, uh, of this tumor. Uh, and that is quite a common location for the pituitary gland to be uh, displaced and thin superiorly. If we think uh, superiorly, the other structures, as I've just uh, shown you, include the optic nerves and chiasm, uh, the hypothalamic pituitary stalk, and then uh, uh, even uh, further superiorly, uh, the hypothalamus. And of course, uh, in the supracellular region in particular, uh, taking out tumors often results in, and we can anticipate a CSF leak uh, that we would uh, repair intraoperatively. Off to the side, as we mentioned already, the carotid artery, the uh, uh, cranial nerves, in particular cranial nerves uh, three and six are most uh, vulnerable. And then in some large tumors, even the me mesial temporal lobe. And then uh, finally, uh, uh, posteriorly, uh, we have the posterior pituitary uh, gland, uh, a very uh, important uh, large venous plexus uh, to be aware of uh, that, uh, that can bleed uh, uh, quite profusely and uh, something we have to be aware of more for other uh, uh, large uh, tumors uh, that, uh, that extend uh, posteriorly. Uh, but that's something to keep in mind. CSF leak, uh, as we mentioned above, the basilar artery is just behind the dorsum cellae or back part of the cella. And uh, in particular, the cranial nerve six as it uh, enters uh, Dorello Canal uh, in the, uh, uh, into the uh, cavernous sinus. And of course, uh, uh, the brainstem uh, is, uh, is also uh, posterior. Uh, we published uh, a number of years ago uh, with our colleagues in Austria, uh, a uh, sequence of uh, imaging that we use uh, interoperatively that includes uh, MR, uh, MRA, uh, and uh, uh, plain CT. And, uh, and that information uh, uh, we use interoperatively uh, with our neuro navigation system so that we can uh, visualize at any uh, time uh, soft tissues, bone, and uh, the vascular uh, tree. <clears throat> so what is the role of surgery in uh, the treatment of uh, acromegaly? If you look at uh, 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 well-recognized uh, recommendations, I think there's pretty general consensus that uh, following diagnosis of acromegaly, uh, surgery is the primary treatment. Uh, and the few people that we would not operate on initially would, those, would be those who either refuse or, uh, or surgery would be uh, contraindicated, uh, or if we could not find a, a target uh, on MR. Um, and uh, I would say that it is uh, uh, very extraordinarily unusual that we would not proceed directly to surgery. And 
Uh, if surgery is successful, then uh, in terms of normalizing uh, and putting the patient into biochemical remission, uh, then we would follow the patients. And if the surgery uh, failed to provide that objective, uh, then we would uh, consider other uh, options. Uh, again, the first option that we always consider is reoperation. Um, and we don't do that very often uh, because oftentimes if there is residual tumor, it's, uh, it's typically because we could not get it out the first time, but we do look at that as an option and then consider uh, medical therapy as Dr. Uh, Imran has uh, discussed and uh, radiation therapy would be also in the armamentarium. The goals of surgery to uh, normalize the uh, IGF-1 and uh, uh, growth hormone, as uh, Dr. Imran uh, talked about, eliminate mass effect of the tumor, and in particular, uh, mass effect on the uh, optic nerves and uh, chiasm. And if there is residual tumor, and if residual tumor is anticipated, uh, this becomes important uh, so that the patient can have some distance between residual tumor and the optic nerves and chiasm uh, so that they uh, will be able to undergo uh, radiation therapy uh, if that is required. In some patients, there is, uh, we see early evidence of extension of tumor into the cavernous sinus. And, uh, and so uh, we want to remove the tumor while we're still able to uh, have a, a reasonable chance of uh, re removing it completely. Uh, once the tumor completely encircles the carotid artery, I know that that cannot be uh, totally surgically removed. And of course, we want to preserve uh, pituitary function and avoid uh, surgical complications related to uh, some of the uh, structures that uh, we reviewed uh, just a few minutes ago. And I would say uh, that uh, surgery in general is, uh, is uh, uh, quite uh, safe, uh, but there are always uh, risks. And in general, uh, we uh, quote a risk of less than 1% of a, of a major uh, complication, uh, but it's always, uh, always important to, uh, to review those. And so what are the remission uh, rates after surgery? <clears throat> there are a number of factors that influence uh, surgical outcomes. Uh, size of the tumor or preoperative uh, growth hormone I IGF-1 levels, which uh, in general uh, often correlate uh, with size of tumor. Uh, invasion of the cavernous sinus and dural invasion are poor prognosticators, <clears throat> as is uh, extracellular extension. And as with uh, other surgical uh, procedures, uh, experience of the surgical team uh, is, uh, is important. Uh, this uh, uh, study from uh, Charlottesville and Ed Law's uh, group uh, there, uh, well-respected, uh, long-standing area of uh, expertise in pituitary uh, surgery, um, uh, reports uh, very favorable outcomes, which I'll, I'll mention, but uh, I think it is important to know that <clears throat> in their series, a third of their patients are microadenomas. And uh, I think this is uh, because of referral pattern uh, in the US, and, and I don't think reflects uh, uh, most of our uh, experiences. In, uh, in their group, uh, they report a uh, remission rate of about 70% uh, after uh, surgery alone. Now, just to come to the issue of uh, tumor size, I don't think it uh, requires uh, too much uh, convincing to tell you that uh, a tumor that is uh, quite small like this and quite accessible, uh, we would anticipate that there would be a very good chance that this uh, could be removed uh, completely, and it's a tumor that uh, a surgeon uh, likes to see. Uh, this one, on the other hand, as you can see, uh, pushing the normal pituitary here, and this is a tumor all up into the uh, supracellular region, and um, most importantly for me, completely encompasses uh, the internal carotid artery. And so, uh, seeing that, as, and we can classify this as a NOS KNOSP grade four, where the carotid artery is completely encircled. 
uh, I know that uh, that uh, patient cannot be uh, put into remission by uh, surgical means uh, alone. And then of course there are uh, uh, you know, unusual uh, but uh, other uh, very large uh, tumors in this patient who uh, presented to one of my colleagues with, uh, with acromegaly and had to have uh, uh, not only a surgery by a, a transsynoidal route, but also a transcranial route. And again, uh, the goal here is, is a reduction of tumor uh, and certainly not to uh, try to use surgery as a means of uh, putting the patient in, in remission. Now, what if we look at the longer term follow-up? And I think this is a, an important uh, uh, paper uh, where a group in the uh, Netherlands looked at 10-year uh, uh, follow-up after uh, transnodal surgery in acromegaly. And in this group, uh, as uh, would be more consistent with uh, what most of us uh, see, uh, the vast majority of these uh, were uh, large tumors or invasive tumors, and, and uh, only a small number were uh, microadenomas. And if we look at what happened in, the, in these patients, uh, I think the important thing uh, to look at here is it started with the 59 patients who all underwent uh, surgery. And of those 59 patients, 27 patients were uh, in remission following surgery. And then five of those recurred uh, over the course of their study. Uh, four within the first five years, and one as late as 10 years uh, after, uh, after surgery. And, and so if you look at the results of this uh, uh, study, it shows that about 40% of patients uh, remain in remission after only surgical intervention. So I think uh, that this, this kind of number uh, keeps us, us surgeons humble uh, and we recognize that this is not purely a surgical disease, although uh, I think that uh, the surgeon uh, still contributes in a significant way to the, to the management of these patients. Um, and so factors that influence uh, outcomes, we've talked about uh, some of these already, and I would just say that uh, in uh, uh, a long, uh, considerably, considerably long time ago, we used to talk about curing people. Now we talk about putting them in remission. And as Dr. Imran indicated, uh, we uh, we have these patients uh, for the long term, not just uh, not just for uh, surgical uh, treatment or medical treatment, and then uh, they're discharged. We 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 continue to follow them. Is there a role for surgery in unresectable tumors? So. As I mentioned, uh, some tumors we can look at and, and say that this uh, is unresectable. This is a, another example of that. So this patient uh, had biochemical, biochemical evidence of acromegaly. And on imaging, we can see a tumor that extends completely around the internal carotid artery on the left. Uh, this patient, uh, the uh, optic uh, nerves we can see up here, uh, vision was intact and the, and the pituitary gland, as is often the case, is draped over the top of the tumor. So in this patient who has an unresectable uh, tumor, uh, is there a role for surgery? And there have been a number of uh, studies uh, that have uh, looked at this over the years. And I think this is, uh, uh, this is one that, is, uh, that caught my attention because it was done in a prospective manner, although uh, there are some uh, issues with the study. Uh, but uh, in, these, uh, in this particular uh, study, uh, patients were uh, randomized to either, and this was a study out of Germany that involved uh, uh, six international sites. Uh, they were randomized either to primary medical treatment or to primary surgical treatment. And if they were treated surgically and they were put into remission, then that was the end of the uh, study for that uh, particular patient. If on the other hand, they did not normalize, then they went into uh, another 
uh, treatment arm which uh, looked at medical therapy. And so they were able to compare medical therapy in patients who had undergone surgery with patients who were primarily treated with medical uh, therapy. And so they uh, started with uh, uh, 41 patients and there was a two to one randomization to the primary surgery uh, arm. And uh, in the primary medically treated uh, group, uh, a very small number of uh, patients, 7%, one out of uh, 15 patients uh, normalized. In the primary surgery group, uh, half the patients were put into uh, remission and the other half uh, were then uh, treated with medical therapy. And I just wanna pause for a moment here. Uh, and this is one of the concerns I have with this uh, study is that this was done only after uh, three months of, uh, of looking at their IGF-1. And as Dr. Rehman said, we, we, we and others have observed that uh, sometimes the IGF-1 can take a long time to normalize. And so it's possible that some of these patients who ended up being normalized may have normalized on their own. Despite that though, I think it is uh, 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 nonetheless uh, uh, quite impressive and seems to fit with, uh, with what a number of others have, uh, have reported uh, in that uh, about half, just a little over half of patients here then went on to normalize uh, with medical therapy. So in the arm that was treated primary uh, medically, 7% uh, normalization. In the arm that underwent surgery, 50% uh, uh, normalized by surgery, and then another 17% with subsequent medical therapy, uh, which means that uh, overall 77% uh, uh, normalization. <clears throat> and importantly for this uh, study, over half the patients uh, normalized after surgery when treated with medical therapy uh, compared to less than 10% when treated primarily with medical therapy. This is some of our own uh, unpublished uh, data uh, looking at uh, acromegaly surgery in the last five years. And on the uh, y-axis, we have the size of the tumor. And as you can see, and it's consistent with other reports, those that are in remission after surgery uh, tend to be smaller tumors than those who remain uncontrolled. And if we look at the uh, numbers from our own experience, interestingly, the, the uh, percent is, uh, is identical to what I just showed you. In, our, uh, in this particular series, 59% uh, uh, were normalized uh, uh, with uh, surgery alone, and then another 18% of the total uh, were normalized with subsequent medical therapy. So uh, finally, I just want to uh, uh, talk uh, briefly about uh, what we do uh, in hospital here in our own uh, practice. <clears throat> and uh, we do have standardized uh, uh, perioperative uh, orders uh, two pages of those which we're happy to share with anybody if they're uh, interested in this. And this is for any, uh, anyone who has had uh, transgenoidal surgery. And then <clears throat> this is uh, uh, something that we started doing a few years ago and we're just in the process now of, uh, of uh, having this uh, published. And uh, what we tried to do is to predict who would need uh, in hospital endocrinology consultation. And, uh, and we do that by filling out this uh, form in the operating room at, after surgery is done. And we ask a few simple questions. Uh, are there any, is a patient on DDAVP? Yes or no. Uh, in the surgery, was all the pituitary tissue removed? Yes or no. Was there aggressive stock manipulation? Yes or no. And are there any other specific uh, considerations unique to this person that uh, that would uh, indicate that endocrinology should be involved and if there's a yes to any of these then endocrinology follows the patient with us in hospital if no then uh, we do not get an in-hospital endocrinology consultation and uh, 
as I mentioned, uh, this is uh, currently under review, but uh, what we've shown is that less than a quarter of patients uh, require in-hospital endocrinology consultation. And so uh, looking at that the other way, uh, uh, 75, over 75% of our patients uh, that are operated on uh, do not have in-hospital uh, consultation with endocrinology. Um, these are the, uh, this is the uh, protocol that we uh, typically uh, use for uh, uncomplicated uh, transcendental cases. I mentioned the standardized orders, uh, the discharge uh, home on a day or two after a surgery. Uh, all of our patients go home on uh, CORTEF uh, and un until they're seen by uh, uh, Dr. Imran and the endocrinology team. At one week, they have uh, blood uh, testing, uh, including hormone testing and electrolytes, in particular sodium, to uh, look for hyponatremia. And uh, then are seen at uh, one to two weeks uh, uh, by my ENT colleague, uh, Dr. Masood, for uh, nasal care, uh, and, uh, and by uh, Dr. Imran, who assesses whether the patient uh, needs to stay on uh, CORTEP as well as uh, assessing the uh, other uh, hormones. Uh, if a patient has had a, if the patient has had a nasoceptal flap, uh, which is a more extensive uh, part of a, a surgery that we do, uh, then they'll be seen again at four weeks by uh, uh, Dr. Masood. And then uh, they're seen at uh, three months by me and Dr. Masood, uh, sorry, me and Dr. Imran, uh, at which time the patients have blood work, visual fields, and MRI. And then we see them six months later, and then yearly for five years, and then every two to three years thereafter. And at each visit, they would have blood work, MRI, and visual field testing until the visual fields have stabilized. Uh, so uh, just to summarize uh, what, uh, what we talked about, uh, we reviewed some uh, cellar and paracellar uh, anatomy. Uh, we talked about uh, some of the structures that we pay particular attention to at the time of surgery. Uh, uh, in particular, the optic nerves and chiasm and the uh, structures in the cavernous sinus, including the internal clotted artery. Uh, we also reviewed uh, some uh, imaging uh, characteristics and uh, in particular, uh, the value of the T2, uh, not only in looking at the uh, intensity of the tumor and in, in predicting its uh, response to medical therapy, but also uh, from a surgical point of view, uh, the ability of the T2 to uh, very clearly delineate uh, the optic nerves and chiasm. Uh, surgery remains the primary uh, treatment modality in uh, patients with uh, acromegaly. Uh, remission rates uh, vary from one center uh, to another for a number of uh, reasons that, uh, that we discussed, uh, but I think uh, when we talk to our patients uh, about uh, a surgery for uh, acromegaly, it, uh, it is individualized to the particular patient uh, and imaging. But if we were to look at uh, things uh, uh, overall, uh, then uh, uh, I would uh, quote them a remission rate uh, of about 60% uh, with, uh, with surgery alone. Uh, we also know that in the patients who uh, do not uh, respond uh, favorably to surgery, that uh, following uh, debulking of the tumor, that we would predict that uh, about half of those still in remission, at least half, uh, would, uh, would come into remission with, uh, with medical therapy. And then uh, finally, we talked about our uh, in-hospital uh, care and, and the importance that these patients uh, need to be followed uh, over the long term uh, in, uh, in what we think is uh, ideally a, a multidisciplinary uh, clinic. So with that, I will finish and I will uh, thank uh, 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 my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Khalid, and this is uh, 
this is a picture of us uh, with him in Halifax during his formative years. Uh, and this was uh, from uh, July 2014. And then uh, finally, just want to uh, acknowledge uh, the importance of, uh, of those who helped to support uh, our group. Uh, Dr. Masood, my uh, ENT surgery, surgery colleague, we do all of these uh, surgeries together. Uh, my uh, assistant, uh, Diane Jardine, our research nurse, Andrea Hebb, our endocrinology uh, nurse, uh, Lisa Tramble, you know, Dr. Imran, our uh, clinic uh, coordinator, uh, Raven Glasgow, and our endocrinology colleague, uh, Deborah Zwicker. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much, David. This is a very clear um, uh, talk. Thank you so much for informative uh, lecture. Now, uh, I'm going to take three, like two or three questions, and then we uh, will move on to the fourth speaker. Um, there is always a debate to use medication to mitostatin analogs before surgery. What are the cases to start it before surgery? Use that routine in your practice to shrink the size of the adenoma. Yeah, so if I understand the question, uh, it is whether we uh, treat the patients uh, medically prior to surgery. Is that the question? Yes. Yeah. So I will uh, give my uh, view and, uh, and then I'll let Dr. Imran uh, comment. Um, I know that, uh, that there is considerable literature out there that says that there is uh, 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 shrinkage of tumors that is uh, quite consistent in the majority of tumors uh, when you give them uh, medical therapy. Um, we have tried it uh, over a short period here a number of years ago and felt that it, uh, we were not that impressed with the, with the response. So, um, there have been some other reports that have talked about uh, medical therapy changing the consistency of the tumor, and that may have an effect on its ability to be removed. That I'm not, uh, I'm not convinced about, but um, it has not been our practice uh, to do that. Yeah, no, I agree. I think the, the reason is, for the most part, studies were done with somatostatin analogs, and the data I showed you earlier at best, you're going to get some improvement in 40% in terms of growth hormone IGF-1 uh, improvement. Uh, tumor shrinkage is even less uh, common. Um, and really, all it does in our experience is it delays surgery by another three to six months because you have to give the treatment for a number of months to uh, have some effect. So we don't use it. Um, we, we feel that if there is any need like that, uh, uh, you know, we, we should uh, go with surgery and you, know, you can start the treatment later on, uh, which probably will be even better because you've got much more effect out uh, after the tumor has been debulked. Okay. And um, other question, would you, would you pre-operate in patients a few days after this initial surgery? Uh, yeah, so the question is, would I reoperate within a few days? Yes. Yeah. Um, I think the practical answer for that uh, is, is no. Um, so we don't, uh, we don't routinely do in-hospital uh, uh, growth hormone testing uh, immediately after surgery. And um, again, it's been uh, something that we've thought about, um, but in a practical sense, uh, with, uh, with modern imaging and the use of the endoscope uh, at the time of surgery, uh, I find that um, we have a very good look around at, uh, at the surgical bed when we're done. And it is uh, pretty much, uh, almost without, set, uh, without exception that we would be surprised by finding some kind of, uh, of tumor there that we could then go back and, and take out right away. So our practice has been to, uh, uh, and, and, and I guess the other thing is that that also just delays hospital or prolongs hospitalization. Uh, and, and so our practice has been to 
uh, to not do that routinely uh, and to evaluate that at, at three months and, uh, and look at the biochemical uh, trend and correlate that with the, uh, with the imaging at the time. Thank you so much. Thank you. With that, we'll move on to the fourth speaker. Thank you. Sir. The fourth speaker will be much more interactive uh, with the audience. Uh, and I'm glad we're approaching now almost 400 attendees uh, for this symposium. Um, our speaker is Dr. Ala Dean Bashir. Uh, He's going to present three interesting endocrine cases as an interactive session. Uh, Dr. Aladdin is a consultant endocrinologist at Dubai Hospital. He's a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and the American College of Endocrinology. Um, he is certified uh, by the American College of Endocrinology in thyroid and neck ultrasound, the ECNU. He is an expert in thyroid and a thyroid ultrasound guided biopsy. Uh, has, he performed over the last 13 years approximately 3,500 procedure. He chaired uh, establishing the Sudanese Diabetes Association in the Gulf chapter starting 2014, and he is the current president for the chapter. He is also a very active member uh, in the research group and published more than 70 original papers and review articles. He co-authored three book chapters in glucagon antagonist history of GLP-1 analogs and management of diabetes in Ramadan. Welcome, welcome Dr. Aladdin, and we would love to hear your cases. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Juma, for the kind introduction. And um, I'd like um, to start um, my presentation um, by first of all acknowledging uh, the colleagues uh, who shared their cases with me. And um, I'm not sure, are you seeing the, yes, this is now my screen, yes. Yes, um, started. Their cases with me. And uh, basically the presentation is, uh, is I'm going to present for the sake of time two cases and uh, there will be some polling questions and I would love to see your opinion on the questions and then we'll shift and get the opinion of Dr. Amran and Dr. Clark on these questions. Um, I initially prepared around five or six cases um, to cover e these points um, in management of acromagaly and pituitary disorders. Uh, however, I've selected only two that will cover most of these uh, questions. So um, the first case is basically a 49-year-old uh, gentleman who is not known to have any previous medical problems. He was admitted just last week uh, to the hospital with one day uh, history of confusion and uh, one week history of headache. Um, he has no history of convulsions or vomiting. And when they brought him to the emergency because he collapsed actually, and his Glasgow coma scale was around uh, 12 over 15. He had clear acromegalic features with uh, prognathism and um, his uh, pupils at that time were reactive and there was no neck stiffness. He was found to have severe hyponatremia and a sodium of 110 and plasma osmolality of 227, but his blood glucose was more than 500 and his A1C is 14%. So uh, we took later uh, further history. He didn't give any history of visual disturbances. He doesn't have any family um, history of um, any endocrine problem. However, his family said that they noticed that the size of the fingers and the feet size has increased over the past uh, six years. Uh, he's not known previously to be diabetic or hypertensive and these were his lab results. Just to summarize it, he has a very low uh, AM cortisol. His prolactin was normal. Uh, his growth hormone was high. The normal level is 0 0.8. He had a growth hormone of 9.6. However, his IGF-1 was normal. His T4 was low uh, and his testosterone was low and LH was as well was low. So uh, they did immediately in the emergency, they did a CT scan for him and the CT scan, uh, if you look at the 
conclusion, it says the patient had uh, diffuse cerebral edema, and it suggested that he had a cellar mass. So they did proceed for uh, an MRI of the cella. An MRI of the cella, if you can see, there is a huge uh, pituitary mass that is touching over the optic chiasm. Uh, however, they, the, the mass did not encircle the carotid um, arteries. Um, and this, you can see the mass in another um, view where you can see the mass touching over the optic chasm, and there are areas of hemorrhage within, um, the, within the pituitary gland. So the report of the MRI said that the findings are very suggestive of a pituitary macroadenoma. However, there are some changes of pituitary apoplexy, um, uh, and the, they are, there is some uh, extension um, upwards to the optic chasm superiorly, and it is extending to the uh, cavernous sinus, the left more than the right side. So this is the history, and I'm going to start the polling questions. I'll give a question, and I'll give 15 seconds for an answer, and then we'll discuss the answers with the uh, panel. So the first question is, how can we explain the normal IGF-1 in the presence of a clear clinical signs and symptoms of acromegaly. So the options are that this is most likely a laboratory error, that this patient has a normal IGF-1 because of his high hemoglobin A1C, the effect of diabetes on acromegaly, on growth hormone, an IGF-1, or is it because of the pituitary apoplexia? And this patient now is having a burned out Cushing, that's why, uh, burned out acromegaly, and that's why he has a normal IGF-1. Is it because this patient might have a chronic liver disease or none of the above? So now we'll go for the polling questions and we'll wait for your answer. We'll have 15 seconds starting now. So um, the answers are for the first one that says laboratory error, we got 3% uh, of the uh, people answered this is the right answer. Uh, A1C, 14%, we got around 34% uh, answered this as a right answer. 26% thought Pituitary apoplexy is the cause of normal IGF-1 in 26% of the people who voted. 30%, they said this is probably because of a chronic liver disease and we did not show the liver function test. And 7% said none of the above. Now, I'd like to revert back to Dr. Imran and Dr. Clark and check their opinion on these answers if Dr. Imran and Clark can comment on this. So um, let me, let me <laughs> thank you. Let me just start by saying that this is a question that I would defer to Dr. Imran. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, first of all, it's a very interesting uh, case um, and reminds me of a case that I saw, actually we saw many years ago in ICU presented with apoplexy. Um, low glossocoma scale and I went to see the patient for a completely different thing. He had a hyponatremia. I said, oh, this patient has acromagnet turned out to be. His IGF-1 on the other hand was elevated. So, I mean, many cases, many things can be. Uh, first of all, a laboratory error is a possibility, though um, it's, uh, in my opinion, uh, unless you're, if you're using a good laboratory, that's uncommon these days. In old days, it was a problem. Um, hyperinsulinemia independent of, uh, of IGF-1 uh, has a direct effect on IGF-1 receptors. So if you have very high, uh, significant insulin resistance, you have a very high IGF, uh, very high insulin, you can have 
acromegaloid features, which is why uh, people who have diabetes, they can get uh, skin um, uh, tags. They can also get some enlargement of the jaw and, and hands and feet, which has been well documented and more common in severe insulin resistance. So that's the other possibility. Um, hemorrhage, uh, pituitary apoplexy in a tumor uh, can lead to definitely reduction in growth hormone IGF-1. I, uh, IGF-1 should not really come down that quickly, but if it's, if it's borderline elevated, it can come down. It is still high normal. It's 284 is right at the upper cusp of normal, so that also is a possibility. Chronic liver disease is a possibility. Malnutrition is a possibility. So there are a number of things that are, uh, that are possible in this situation. But if you have a classic features of uh, acromegaly, then, then you certainly uh, need to look at all these options. Uh, well, we'll go now to the uh, second question. And the second question says, what will be the best next step? And the options are treat diabetes and repeat the IGF-1 and growth hormone after six weeks, or should we proceed for surgery and check IGF-1 and growth hormone after surgery, or it's most likely I burned out acromegaly and there is no need for any further workup, or should we proceed directly and right now to do an OGTT as long as we have an elevated growth hormone? And we're going to start voting, and the voting starts now for 15 seconds. Well, um, the voting is over, and the answers are 37% believed that we should treat his diabetes and repeat IGF-1 and growth hormone after six weeks. 41%, and this is the majority, they thought we need to proceed for surgery and check IGF-1 and growth hormone after surgery. Uh, a very small percent, which is 3%, they, th they thought we don't need to do any further intervention because the IGF-1 is down to normal. And around 20% thought we have to go for an OGTT. Um, I'm back to Dr. Um, Amran and Dr. Clark for their comments. Okay. Dr. Amran, yes. Dr. Amran, do you hear us? Uh, Ala, you can, uh, you know, you can comment till we get the connection back with the uh, international speakers. Okay. So, um, as Dr. Imran mentioned earlier, the, the high blood glucose level might affect um, the uh, IGF-1 and growth hormone levels. However, in a patient with a huge adenoma with pituitary apoplexy uh, that, that affects all pituitary hormones, I think the best next step, as the question stated, is to proceed for surgery and check the IGF-1 and growth hormone after the surgery. Um, being a burnt out acromegaly, um, it's very unlikely because we still have very high growth hormone, and again, as Dr. Imran commented, the IGF-1 level is at the upper limit of normal. It's not actually um, suppressed. So um, the best next step in a case with a pituitary apoplexy is to proceed for surgery, and then we can do the uh, OGTT, um, I mean, and check the IGF-1 level and growth hormone uh, later. So, uh, Proceeding to question three. Uh, did, did we get the uh, international speakers or not yet? Allah, you can proceed. We'll proceed. So the third question is, how would you proceed 
with the management in this patient. Now these are the options for management of a patient with uh, pituitary apoplexy and we could see initially that his, there is some defects in his pituitary hormones. So would you start steroids without doing a synaxin test and then you go for surgery and later replace the hormones, all the other hormones, or you start steroids and you don't do synaxin test because his baseline was uh, 52. And then you do surgery and later replace hormones as necessary. I mean, as you repeat the tests after the surgery and you decide based on that, or you do, you give steroids after doing a synaxin test and then you do surgery and then you go for replacement of the hormones later or you go for steroids, another hormonal replacement, and you don't go for surgery, or you start steroids after doing a synaxin surgery, and then you repeat the hormonal profiles as necessary. So these are the options, and uh, we'll start the polling now, and you have 15 seconds. We're back on. Well, um, I will show you the, the answers. Now, the, the question was, what will be the best step in management? And we thought the patient uh, cortisol AM was 52, and he had a low uh, T4, low um, testosterone, low LH and um, high normal IGF-1 and growth hormone. So these were the options. Start steroids without doing a synaxin test, then do surgery and replace all the hormones, or start steroids without synaxin, do the surgery, and then repeat the hormonal tests. And based on the post-operative results, you decide what hormones you need. Or you go for steroids after doing a synaxin test. And then you do surgery and then you replace the hormones or you don't do surgery at all. Or you do steroids, synaxin surgery and you repeat hormones as necessary later. So these are the options. And we got 27% uh, who agreed to do surgery after synaxin, um, steroids after synaxin, then surgery and then replacement of the hormones. And 26% said there is no need for synaxin. So we have 50% of the votes within these two um, questions. So um, I'd love to hear your comments on this. Yeah, no, this, is, this is an interesting question. So uh, first of all, I think um, I'd like to uh, ask Dr. Clark to comment whether, because the GCS of 12, whether uh, we don't know. The only indication for surgery in apoplexy really is if there is any problem with uh, vision. Other than that, uh, surgery is probably not uh, urgently needed. Now, with I can answer the question with regards to hormonal replacement, though. So we have done this, and we have, uh, we have published a number of papers in this area. If you have, a uh, in this situation, if you have a cortisol level, which is uh, so low, you do not need to do an ACTH or synaptic test. Uh, these patients, uh, uh, particularly in the context of an apoplexin tumor, this patient uh, almost uh, guaranteed has adrenal insufficiency. Uh, we typically, when we replace them, we, we uh, always uh, give cortisol a cortef first, and then if they have a concomitant thyroid replacement, we would give thyroxine a little bit later because if you give thyroxine before hydrocortisone therapy or cortisol replacement therapy, you can push these people into adrenal crisis. So even if it's a half an hour difference to begin with for the first time, we start with steroids uh, and then give thyroxine replacement afterwards. So. I mean, uh, whether surgery is indicated in this particular case, uh, I'll defer to Dr. Clark, but certainly from the hormonal point of view, I wouldn't wait to do uh, an ACTH test in someone with that type of Glasgow comma scale. 
And synectin test is not a very good test uh, on inpatients anyway, uh, because, um, you know, and typically we published a paper showing that if you're doing a synectin test, do a 250 microgram test and don't look at the 30 minute value, go for 60 minute value because your 30 minute value in this type of situation is going to give you a false reading, generally a low reading. So you want to go for a 60 minute value, which will give you a much better sensitivity and specificity. So what question of surgery, maybe Dr. Clark can address that. Yeah, no, uh, interesting, uh, interesting case. Um, just one thing to keep in mind uh, is that uh, in, and we've seen this with a number of patients who have uh, quite impressive apoplexy, and, uh, and we don't operate on them unless, as Dr. Irman says, there's vision uh, compromise. And we have a number of patients uh, where the tumor literally disappears over time, and presumably the, the tumor has infarcted uh, and, and, uh, and, and just uh, melts away over time. Now, in this patient, it's difficult because of the uh, GCS being 12. So, uh, uh, and the other, uh, the other issue with him is the sodium is 110. And that's not really ideal for taking someone uh, to the operating room. So, um, if, uh, if I were pushed and felt that, uh, uh, that his vision were compromised or his GCS remained low, that I could not evaluate that, um, then I may be forced to do that. And uh, I think uh, uh, knowing the steroid status beforehand really is of no consequence from a surgical point of view because no matter what his uh, steroid uh, function is preoperatively, I'm going to cover him with steroids uh, interoperatively. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, you may have a situation where uh, with, uh, with uh, correction of his uh, sodium, um, and and his uh, replacement of hormones that you know he he may be okay and not require surgery um, uh, because he may not uh, not have vision uh, compromised. Uh, uh, so I would say surgery yes if clear vision compromised or if I can't really uh, determine that based on based on assessment. Yeah, but certainly down the road, surgery may be the option once he has stabilized. And then you will have the opportunity to reassess him uh, with growth hormone IGF-1 and all that. So that's, I think that's the point. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for the comment. Um, now we'll proceed uh, direct to the second question. And I, I'm sure Dr. Imran will like the next case because um, the case um, is an area of um, his interest. And this is basically about a lady who is 57 years old, uh, who attended our clinic for the first time for evaluation of hyperprolactinemia, which has been diagnosed in 2016. And she was uh, referred from the surgical department in our uh, sister hospital. Um, she was actually referred to us because she was morbidly obese and she was desiring um, to go for a bariatric surgery. And um, she has other comorbidities as dyslipidemia and hypothyroidism. And this is her history. Um, she was uh, diagnosed with hypothyroidism after a total thyroidectomy for a multinodular goiter with a retrosternal extension in a private hospital in 2012. Then she underwent a transphenoidal surgery um, in February 2010 for a macroprolactinoma. She continued to have headache and high prolactin, so she underwent another surgery in 2014. The outcomes of the surgery were mentioned here down that uh, there was no um, actually um, much of, uh, she had a CSF leak postoperatively and that was managed by a lumbar puncture. Then she continued to follow uh, with us. She had another MRI that was after the surgery. Um, it showed a large, smooth, moderately enhancing lesion of 2.4 uh, times 3.1 centimeter, a huge macroadenoma. And um, the lesion was showing a supracellular extension and it was pushing the optic chiasma. Um, then the histopathology after the first surgery showed that was a pituitary adenoma. 
And after the second surgery, the histopathology showed that this is a pituitary tissue with hemorrhage and some degenerative changes suggestive of infarctive pituitary adenoma. So uh, in her previous two operations in 2010 and 2014, they removed a pituitary tissue. Uh, however, postoperatively, she still continued to have high prolactin. And we started to increase her capergolin dose from 0 0.5 milligram per week to 0 0.7 milligram per week and still her prolactin continued to be very high, more than 6,000. She had a high ACTH, normal cort 24-hour urinary cortisol, growth hormone and gonadal axis were um, suppressed. However, prolactin did not respond. So we started again increasing the dose from uh, 0 0.75 to 1.5 milligram per week. And if you can see here, these are prolactin levels. If you look at the left side, the prolactin is always 4,000, 6,000, uh, 1,100, uh, and it continued to be uh, at this level. Her growth hormone IGF-1 were uh, low. If you look at her um, gonadal axis, she has a suppressed LH and FSH. And um, as I showed before, the uh, IGF-1 and growth hormone are low and her ACTH is mildly elevated. So we carried on with the workup. Breast and axilla ultrasound was unremarkable. Bone mineral density was normal. Um, echo, after increasing the dose, we thought we need to do a baseline echo that didn't show much of changes. And uh, we did an MRI cell lab two years after her second surgery and we could still see a macroadenoma of 1.6 centimeter um, in the pituitary. Now, during her follow-up, the prolactin continued to increase from 6,000 to 10,000, uh, but uh, it has never dropped below that. So what we did is we started increasing her capergolin dose, and it has been titrated many times, until we reach a four milligram per week. These are eight tablets per week. And uh, she, we shifted her to promocryptine. We thought she, she, she wasn't able to tolerate capergolin. We went to promocryptine. She was unable to tolerate it. We shifted again to quinagolide um, uh, trial, but again, she did not respond. Despite that, her prolactin continued to be very high. And here I'm summarizing the timeline for her follow-up MRIs. In 2017, the lesion on the left side of the cella, mildly displacing the cavernous without significant invasion. In 2018, the size of the tumor, it was 1.6, now it was 1.98 times 1.37 centimeters. So the size of the adenoma is increasing. And then in 2018, the size of the uh, prolactinoma has increased from almost two centimeters to 3.2 centimeters, despite being on capergolin, despite being on, uh, despite being on capergolin, um, four milligram per week. And in 2019, the size has increased from 3.2 to 3.9 times 2.1 centimeter. So my questions, and with this, I'll probably finish the case discussion. These are my questions to the panel. Is there any role for another surgery in such patients? And the second question- Ala, your connection is lost. Uh, Ala, we cannot hear you. Can you repeat? Yeah. Um, so um, can you hear me now? Yes, it's very clear. Uh, this is the timeline for, for her MRI. We have been doing the MRI almost annually. In 2018, we did it twice. The size of the adenoma from 1.6 uh, centimeter has increased in 2019 to almost four centimeters despite being on capergolin, four milligram per week. So my questions to the panel, what's the role of a second or a third surgery in such case. 
And should we label this patient as a patient with resistant prolactinoma? And what are the current approaches to resistant prolactinoma? Is there any role for radiation therapy or chemozolomide in, in, in such cases? And I will leave the floor now to Dr. Imran and Dr. Clark to comment. <clears throat> so I'm going to let Dr. Clark comment on surgery and then I'm going to talk about uh, medical time because he has to go, he's in OR now, he has to run. <laughs> so uh, yeah, another uh, interesting, uh, interesting case. And uh, so um, <clears throat> it sounds to me like, uh, yes, there is a role for surgery. Uh, and this is uh, without uh, seeing the uh, seeing the MRI, which of course I, I would need to do. But uh, and I think that this uh, this is a resistant prolactinoma, and it uh, I would think that uh, radiation uh, is a, is uh, something that uh, we would uh, very much uh, consider. After so surgery. after surgery, yes, and so. Uh, but the goal of surgery now has to be tailored to this particular circumstance. The goal of surgery is not to put this patient in remission. The, we're told that the tumor completely encircles the uh, internal carotid artery. The main goal uh, for me would be to uh, reduce the uh, tumor bulk and to provide uh, some space. And typically, I like to look for uh, two or three millimeters between residual tumor and the overlying optic nerves and chiasm. So uh, that would be uh, my goal from a surgical point of view. And uh, I think it's also important that we have our radiation oncology colleagues uh, notified and on board because uh, if I go in and operate and then we wait another year for the radiation uh, group to be involved, then we'll be back to square one. So, uh, and then I'll, I will uh, let uh, Dr. Imran uh, comment on the role of, uh, potential role of uh, temozolomide, but uh, those, would be, uh, those would be my thoughts uh, on this case. And as Dr. Imran said, uh, I do have to leave uh, uh, for a, a surgical case. So uh, just to say thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, participate. I've really enjoyed this. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Thank you so much. We appreciate your presence. With Thank us you, Cal. Your so, you. very quickly, um, first of all, undoubtedly, it's a, a resistant prolactinoma. Uh, one thing that I would have liked to see uh, in the first place in pathology was what was the KI67 index. If the KI67 index in these, if this type of tumor is over 3-4%, which generally is, then uh, these are aggressive tumors, but this is an aggressive tumor. So how I would approach it, I would definitely, if you have a good surgeon, ask them to remove as much tumor as they possibly can. I would very quickly go for radiation therapy without wasting any time because the tumor will grow back and then becomes more difficult. Um, Timozolamide, uh, there is a role for it, but it is, uh, if you look at the data, most recent data came out of Germany, um, generally speaking, uh, it is uh, effective in about 30-40% of the cases uh, at the most over a long period of time. Uh, and I have used it um, in some cases, but it is uh, somewhat uh, moderate, modestly effective. One other medication that I have used very successfully in this case is uh, Paciriotide. I've used Paciriotide because sometimes these patients also have aberrant somatostatin receptors. Uh, and if you have a tumor tissue, I would have them look for somatostatin receptors as well. If they have a S2, S5 receptor, go for pacerotide. I have had a case like that, very difficult. We looked at it, treated with pacerotide, the tumor is gone now. And I've been following this patient for about 10, 11 years now. So those are the two things that I would do. KI-67 index, uh, if they have uh, wax blocks, go back on them, have a look at them. Um, quickly, surgery, uh, gamma knife or stereotactic radiation therapy is as soon as possible. Uh, uh, Timozolomide probably would not be my first choice because it's going to be less effective and pasteurotide if you have those, uh, those receptors. That's how I would approach it. Um, and um, I think it's a, it's a, it's a very tough case. I'm, I'm, 
I'm sorry to see that it's a tough case. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Imran, for your comments. Thank you. Um, that was my last slide, and I will uh, refer back to Dr. Juma Al Kaabi for um, any questions or any comments. Uh, thank you so much. As we're coming to the end, uh, I would like to thank the speakers, uh, Dr. Aladin Bashir, Dr. Ali Umran, Dr. David Clark, and uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Khaled Dahmani. Uh, he is the main organizer of this uh, He's the main culprit. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you've done a great job, and uh, we, uh, we have learned over the last two hours. And I would like to apologize to the audience. Uh, we got something like 350 participants. They placed a number of questions during this given time. We are not able to cover all the questions. My sincere apology. And uh, I would like to thank uh, our sponsor of the event, Novartis, with unconditional educational uh, sponsorship for the event. Thank you so much. And uh, I would like to remind the participants that uh, there are CME hours. For you log into the website, and you do the evaluation of the events, and your evaluation is very, very important to us. We'd like to improve our future events, and based on your feedback, that will be taken into account to improve our future events. Uh, thank you so much, and there will be uh, CME hours will be granted at a later time as you fill in the details. Thank you so much. Uh, as at the end, I would like to thank everybody and thank you for being with us over this nice evening. Right, have a nice evening, guys. Take care. Thank, thank you, you thank so you. much. Thank, thank you, Alan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.